So my name is Trevor Burbridge. For those of you who don't know me, I work in BT Applied Research and I have a team specifically looking at network assurance and diagnostics. Uh, and you'll see why, hopefully very shortly, uh, why, why Idris is, is uh, presenting the topics he's presenting. Um, so Professor Idris Eckley is from the University of Lancaster, uh, in particular from a doctoral school on statistics and operational research called STORY. And we've worked with uh, Idris's group for a number of years now, quite a few students and research associates on a number of different projects. OK, so without further ado, can I introduce uh, Professor Idris Eckley? OK, so thanks Trevor, for the introduction again, and uh, it's great to be here today to talk about the work that we've been doing over a, a few years now on uh, anomaly detection with, uh, with folks at BT. Um, just before I get going on on uh, the detail of the talk as ever this work uh, is representative of a contribution from a whole load of different people uh, both uh, at Lancaster where we've got a team of well I've got a team of uh, great colleagues in uh, Paul Fernhead and Rebecca Killick uh, and PhD students uh, and former postdocs here um, including Sam Tickle, Alex Fish, Lawrence Bardwell uh, and others, and also several people on BT side who've worked with us over the years to help uh, develop and encourage these methods. Uh, so Trevor, uh, who you know, uh, Dan Gilks, Kel Jensen, Dave Yerling, Steve Cassidy and Peter Willis, and also more recently Martin Tvetten, who's just completed a PhD at the University of Oslo and done some work with Paul Fernand and myself. Uh, just as a reminder, um, and for those of you that were at Nick Grace's talk uh, a couple of months back, uh, you'll have seen these next couple of slides. Um, this work forms part of NGCD, uh, CDI, which is a prosperity partnership uh, jointly funded by EPSRC, uh, as well as the uh, UKRI's research funders, uh, and also uh, BT. And this is a program of research that's running over five years, and we're just over the the halfway point now. Um, and the aim of the program as a whole is to develop the next generation of data driven methods and technologies for the resilient autonomic digital infrastructure of the future. And this is a, a cross disciplinary program across four different universities with quite different disciplines uh, coming through from from uh, each of the four partner universities. So uh, there's the networking group based in the, the computer science department at Lancaster together with uh, my group in statistics. Um, on the Cambridge uh, side, we've got folks from the uh, Institute for Manufacturing as well as people from the Judge Business School. Uh, at Surrey, we've got people working in networking. And at Bristol, we've got folks from engineering working on wireless systems uh, uh, and uh, novel machine learning methods. The program's objectives as a whole are, 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 are quite ambitious, as you'd expect of a, a five year, five million pound program. So uh, the, the first aim is to develop a completely new architecture for digital infrastructures composed of highly dynamic network functions based on a micro NFE approach um, that are in themselves able to adapt to the real time requirements of the future digital services. Um, Sec secondly, we're looking to create a new autonomic framework for digital infrastructure to equip the nodes of the infrastructure network with the ability to understand their state, detect and diagnose disruptions to service and to take autonomous actions. And it's in this middle part here where we within the statistics community are coming in on the detection and diagnosis uh, activity. And then the final strand of work is around implementing the approaches for successful integration of these technologies within business functions uh, with the aim to improve service assurance uh, and organizational values. OK, so uh, detecting disruptions and then focusing more on on the kind of the statistical element within this program. So the NGCDI focus really builds on a track record of research uh, that's been going on between Lancaster and BT uh, for a number of years, particularly in the area of change point analysis. Um, and the key focus really is on developing these novel detection and diagnostic methods required to establish automated analyses and anomaly identification to return, routinely inform decision making and drive automation. So the aim ideally would be that we have suitably general methods that we can 
uh, embed within systems that uh, flag events as they occur and can learn which events are and aren't useful. Our aim is to provide the mechanisms to transfer the raw data into effective actions then, creating efficient change analysis and anomaly detection techniques to detect these uh, different uh, uh, changes in operational performance. So why change points and anomalies? Um, I guess the intuition here is that uh, sudden changes in operational performance tend to manifest themselves as changes within the observed data streams if you've got a, an instrumented system. We may not know in advance which types of changes to expect or which interventions to make in response to it, but the first step is in detecting those changes or those anomalies and then from there identifying what, what actions we might take. And at Lancaster for the last decade, um, our focus on change point analysis has been on computationally efficient and accurate methods for detecting changes, particularly in one dimensional you know, kind of 1D uh, data sequences. Uh, and in recent work with BT, we've been looking at methods for detecting changes in multivariate sequences, parallelization methods for change point detection and and most recently online non-parametric change point methods. Now, just as an example of some of the thinking that goes behind this, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the parallelization work, just as an example of um, the sort of Lancaster approach to, to these problems. Um, but before that, change points 101. Uh, so let's get into what, what do I mean by a change point? Um, I promise that there aren't too many equations in here. I've tried my very best to avoid putting uh, um, maths in where possible, um, but I've got to have a little bit in. So for data Y1 to Yn, let's assume we've got a sequence of data Y1 to Yn. If a change point exists at a point tall, then uh, what we mean by that is that the structure of the data from Y1 to Y tall differ from Y tall plus one to Yn in some way. So there are many different ways in which we could have those changes um, manifesting themselves. It could be something like a change in mean, like we see here, where we go from one regime to another uh, and then up to another one. Or it could be a change in volatility, as we see here, where we've got uh, kind of low volatility to start with, moving to a region of higher volatility for easing off again and then flaring up. We could have changes in regression. Or we could have uh, a mixture of these things. So we could have changes in variance here on a sinusoidal function uh, or we could have changes in the second order structure so in the time dependent structure where we maybe have stronger time dependent structure here and weaker time dependent structure here and the game of course is where are these changes that's what we're trying to identify so the sorts of questions we might ask are has a change occurred if it has occurred where is that change in the data sequence what is the difference between the pre and post change data? Are we able to put some sort of probabilistic value on, on the probability that a change has occurred? Or how certain are we of that location? And that's just a one change point. If we have a whole, you know, huge uh, long sequence of data, we could expect that there are many changes. And so we could ask all of those questions for each change. But then underlying that, well, why has there been a change? And the question that I'm increasingly starting to focus on with colleagues is, are those changes that we've identified of relevance? Just because they're statistically significant doesn't necessarily mean that they're practically interesting, right? OK, so very simple problem to talk about at, at one level. Um, and you'd think that the search problem was easy. But let's just take a, a moment and think about if we have M change points, within a data sequence of length n. The, the challenge then is to identify where are these m change points, tor1 up to tor m, and even to work out what m might be. Now, if there are n data points, there are two to the n minus one possible solutions. And if m was known in advance, then that would boil, that would reduce, you know, we would reduce down to n minus one, choose m minus one solutions. So if we had a, a sequence of a length of 1,000 and 10 change points within that, then there are only two, just, two, just over 2 times 10 to the 21 solutions for us to have to worry about. 
So that's quite a lot of calculations and quite an intensive space for us to have to search through. Um, and that's where the statistical problem starts to come in. Is how can we search through this space efficiently so that we can uh, find these solutions accurately before, you know, before we've all given up the will to live? So that's really been one of the early focuses for us at Lancaster was the development of uh, an efficient, a computationally efficient approach that was also accurate at detecting changes in data sequences. And this uh, came out in 20, an early, was one of our early works in the area and came out in 2012 uh, and resulted in what's called the PELT algorithm, so the pruned exact linear time algorithm. And here we've been able to reduce the cost of searching for all changes within a sequence uh, from an order n cubed operation to an order n operation, making some slight assumptions which mean that it works, uh, which are reasonable for many popular settings. And that method can be used to detect changes in mean, variance, regression, um, you know, so a large number of different uh, uh, scenarios. But then the question comes, could we speed that up further? And so this is work that we did with uh, Sam Tickle, who uh, was uh, uh, an IK student uh, sponsored by BT. Uh, and the question really we were asking ourselves was, given a multi-core structure, can we gain further speed through parallelization of PELT? Now, PELT uses a dynamic program, so of itself isn't easy to, you know, it's not obvious how you parallelize it uh, and maintain all the properties. Uh, certainly an embarrassingly parallel approach isn't obvious. Um, and if we could speed it up, what speed ups might we realize through the paral parallelization? And equally, what guarantees from an inference perspective can we make on such a change point analysis? So this is the work uh, that we were considering now. Uh, I'm sure many of you would be familiar with it, more familiar with this than me. Um, but we were using split and merge techniques to parallelize PELT, effectively trying to split the search space between different cores on the computer, then merging the results from each of those uh, uh, split steps before then reanalyzing the data using the candidate changes to obtain the global solution. Now, that sounds practically very straightforward. Um, and when you stop and think about it, it's, you know, it's quite easy to implement it. You know, we can chunk the data, for example, uh, is one approach we could use. Uh, so we could split the search uh, space into these continuous regions, like the, uh, we've done here into five different regions. Um, send each of those segments of data to a core and analyze each of those individually using PELT, then merge the results of that step, uh, and then reanalyze the data using candidate changes only to obtain the global solution. Now, in practice, we found that Overlap, having some overlap regions was valuable to avoid missing changes that are occurring very near the boundaries. Um, but even with all of that, it's not clear what the properties are of, uh, of, of, of this from a kind of statistical perspective. What guarantees can we put? Um, I won't go into the theorem, but there's a theorem that we can establish and we did establish here, which basically allows us to say that you know, it behaves in the way that we would like it to. But just because we can split it in a certain way, a certain way doesn't mean that we'd be guaranteed these theoretical properties. But effectively, what we get is a guarantee that the solutions will converge to the true change points um, as as the number of data points that we observe um, increases. Uh, a second uh, uh, approach here would be to deal the points out um, uh, across uh, different um, cores. So here we could. Uh, effectively take every um, piece uh, data point and send e each of those points to core one uh, and then move on to the next data point and send each of those every piece data sequence to the next core. Each core then fitting changes only using the points assigned. Um, what happens then is we get a cluster of estimates about each change when we merge those results back again. And so the, the reanalysis step is particularly important here, and there's a couple of different ways um, we can do it. But for example, we could focus only on the segments about each, each of the kind of clusters of changes we've identified. When we run this, what we also, uh, if we and develop our methods generally, what we do is then conduct a simulation study just using some simulated data that we've created. And here we created a few different scenarios where we've got uh, 
very few changes, quite, uh, quite a few changes here, some which are further apart, some which are closer together. And what we found was that the average false alarms, so things that we don't want to happen, that they were lowest uh, in pelt or the or either of the chunk uh, or deal type paralyzation approaches, which is what we were hoping to find. So we don't actually get any worse performance on this study through uh, either pa paralyzing through chunk or deal. Um, but what we gained even on four cores was quite considerable speed up um, of the algorithm. And actually, if we if we increase the number of cores and look at the mean computational gain, what we've got here, the, the lower black line is uh, kind of uh, uh, a linear uh, computational gain, um, uh, uh, quadratic here. And what we can see is, you know, uh, sorry, linear computational cost, quadratic computational cost, and then where chunk and deal sit in between. And what we can see is that the costs for chunk and deal are, you know, very low. And when the change magnitude is partic particularly large and more obvious, then you really get a gain um, through using chunk and deal. So that that was basically a, a question. That question was inspired by an applied challenge of, well, what could you do to speed it up further? Um, and um, what we try and do in, when we're given a challenge like that is, you know, think about the generic problem and then develop a general modeling framework to deal with that problem. Uh, and then uh, identify and implement computational approaches that we can use to speed up the analysis. So develop a statistical framework and then develop statist compute, com computational statistical tricks to speed up the analysis. Then establish some properties for the framework so we can say what the guarantees are that we can make for the assumption set that we're dealing with. And then demonstrate that working in simulated and uh, applied settings. So that's the kind of approach that we've been doing with change points. So for recent contributions here, um, we've been uh, looking at different things. So of recent years, so there's paralyzation work, which uh, Sam Tickle did, and also how we might efficiently search for changes in a higher dimensional setting where you can imagine that you might have, there's no reason why changes should occur in all series at all times. In the higher dimensional setting, for example, you could have subsets of changes occurring, switching on and off at different times. Um, so how can we search efficiently in that space? There was some work that's great work that Sam did there. Um, problems on most recent change point detection that Lawrence Bardwell did uh, during his PhD uh, with BT and work on non-parametric change uh, detection methods. And many of these are available in um, open source packages. So we've got a, a package which is quite well documented now um, and has an article that accompanies it called Change Point, which is uh, an R package available on CRAN. And there's also um, a package for the non-parametric work called changepoint.mp, which is also available on CRAN. And so that that underlies a lot of the work that we do is that, that, that we try and make that work reproducible in its generic form. Um, so it's easy for others to use, but also to give us the, you know, to, to give a kind of assurance and a credibility to the methodology that, uh, you know, that we're confident enough that we are happy to make it public and be tested by others. OK, so from from change points to anomalies then, um, and as we as we started on NGCDI, I think the initial view was that we'd be focusing a bit more on change point problems, but as time's gone on, anomalies have been um, creeping in more and more and more. Um, and so very early on, we decided to put a more of a focus on um, anomaly detection. Um, so as someone who's uh, worked in statistics from a time where we used to wish that there was more data, um, you know, historically, there was a view of anomalies, aren't they just getting in the way? Uh, you know, as a statistician, you might think of an anomaly as being an outlier, uh, and they're really well known for those working in the data sciences in general. Um, we might seek to identify outliers to understand their influence on a model if we're building it, or historically, we might seek to develop a model that is robust to an anomalous observation or robust to an outlier. But increasingly, what we've been finding whilst talking to Trevor and Dan and Dave Yearling and, and Kel Jensen and others is that anomalies are actually interesting. The anomalies that the, the devil is in the detail and and those 
those anomalies are often quite meaningful and fleeting though they may be, it can be really, really important to identify them quickly, accurately and with confidence so that corrective actions can be taken or an understanding formed of what's going on. So what do we mean by an anomaly here? Well, um, in its simplistic sense, an observation not conforming with the rest of the data. The cause of an anomaly, that could be to do with the recording error. There may be some, something going wrong with the actual instrumentation, or there may be something going wrong with the, the process that the in, uh, instruments are observing. And if we want to detect them, well, often the motivations coming from an operational context um, to allow timely intervention and action to avoid um, or minimize the effect of some underlying event or cause. Um, or from a statistical context as well, it's good if we can identify these anomalies because then our models become more robust. In thinking about anomalies compared to a change point, um, we've started to think about it as follows. So anomaly, an anomaly is one or a sequence of observations not conforming to the general pattern. Um, so in other words, they're representative of temporary behavior. Whereas a change point is a, an observation after which there's a sustained change in behavior. So a, so a, a temporary behavior versus a, a sustained behavior. Now, an anomaly can take many different forms, of course, and there's quite a, diff, you know, quite a lexicon of terms that we can use here. Um, global and uh, contextual anomalies are single observations that are outliers uh, with regards to complete data set uh, and their local context, respectively. Um, and I tend to think of those as being point anomalies. Um, whereas a collective anomaly is defined as a sequence of observations that are not anomalous when considered individually, but together form an anomalous pattern. Um, but that said, so that's from a kind of a data perspective, but if we talk to um, folks in any organization, they'll have their own view of what the anomaly challenge is. So um, Nick touched on, on these quotes uh, in his opening talk of these sequence of talks. Um, but Trevor might think of an anomaly as being um, it, something arising in the following. So continuously in real time, we're learning about the normal operation of a network and automatically alerting anomalous behavior that may be an in indication of failure, degrading performance or misconfiguration. Or Peter Willis might think of it as a problem like as follows. So can you detect the onset of when a day is starting to behave differently? So anomalies are different from the normal behavioral structure of the data, but the very nature of that difference can be very context dependent. So I'm now going to focus a, uh, a bit on work we've been doing in relation to the the first of these sort of uh, anomaly challenges. So can we can we spot anomalies which are different from the normal operational behavior? So here um, we're going to think of anomalies as being of two different types. So we're going to have our collective anomalies and here's an example of a collective anomaly here where there's a sudden uh, change in mean within this uh, simulated data sequence or we may have a, a different change here where where instead of it being a change in mean we have a change in in the variability of the data uh, or we could have a sudden increase in the variability of the data here um, so that we think of as being a kind of collective anomaly and a point anomaly uh, or a kind of global or textual anomaly to use the other uh, terminology. The point anomaly are these points which are just individual points which are distinct from uh, the steady state operation of the system. And, and our key assumption that we're going to make in our modeling here is that the normal operational uh, structure is such that we have a kind of steady state data flow and that departures, anomalous de uh, structure departures away from that uh, steady state. So um, together with Alex Fish uh, and Paul Fernhead, we've been doing um, developing a suite of methods based around this idea of a, a point and a collective anomaly that departs from a baseline structure. Uh, and these methods, were, or, the, 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 or the first of these methods we're calling CAPA, collective and point anomaly detection. So the way we would model a, a collective anomaly within this framework is as two change points, actually. 
one change point uh, away from the normal behavior in the data and one back to it again. So much like in this previous slide where here we had our steady state data here. And then suddenly there's a departure away from it as the mean increases and then a departure uh, a return back to the steady state. And so for data, if we have to observe um, n observations x1 up to xn, the data follow, a, we're assumed, assumed to follow a model of this form here, where the parameter of interest, theta, uh, can take different values over time. Um, the baseline value is theta naught. And then the first departure starts at time point S1 and ends at time point E1. And at here in that region, it takes a value of theta 1. Similarly, between S2 and E2, it would take a value of theta 2. And finally, there's a kth departure uh, where k may or may not be known, um, where typically, typically it's unknown, where SK, um, between SK and EK, and it takes a value of theta k here. And we would embed this modeling framework within what we call a penalized uh, cost framework. And in, in doing that, uh, this would be solvable by a prune dynamic program, which means that we are able to actually solve the problem a lot more quickly um, than we might if we were just using this in a kind of uh, brute force way. In the same way that with the Pelt algorithm, we were able to speed up from a, 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 a cubic uh, to a, an order n uh, operation. Here we're using the same sort of tools to enable us to get towards a, a, a faster um, um, faster estimate of what's going on. So that's for the collective anomalies. For a point anomaly, we're going to model that as a special case of a change, an epidemic change in variance, which is only allowing a change uh, uh, of, of length one. Um, and in that, in this setting, what we're able to do is establish some really nice theory about the properties of the collective anomaly estimates in particular, um, and show that they, the, uh, we, the estimates that we obtain are well behaved, so they they tend to the true values very quickly and at the right places. So just as an example here, here we've got a baseline structure which um, uh, whilst it's constant, actually we can adapt for that in, in reality by using some detrending methods. Um, and the game here is to work out where are the uh, anomalies. So I'll just give you a second or two to think about where they might be. Now, if we were to use a traditional um, approach, um, such as um, uh, using the, say, the two sigma rule, kind of, kind of straightforward but simple statistical approach, um, and use robust STL, which is a method for kind of removing the trend, what we'd identify are these point anomalies here. And to be fair, several of those point anomalies you, you, you'd be happy to, to identify. But the, when we use Kappa, what we find are actually there are fewer point anomalies in truth. There are just these four. Uh, and we also have this collective anomaly here between these two time points. Uh, in our usual way, we conduct a simulation study. And here I'm giving uh, the example of a setting where things are fairly obvious. So we have some collective anomalies uh, here. In, in our simulated data set and, a, and the steady state baseline. And on the right hand side, we've got um, like ROC curves to show the performance of different methods. Uh, in essence, the quicker the method goes up to one and across, uh, to taking up that kind of that left, uh, left hand vertical and then the right hand uh, horizontal, um, the better the method is. Now, uh, the black line here is Kappa. The red line is PELT because we thought we'd just compare it with PELT. And then these two methods are methods that were are in the literature proposed uh, actually by a couple of tech, different tech companies. Um, and they don't fare so well in, in this setting, even though that they're designed to detect these sort of uh, 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 collective anomalies. Now, if we uh, include some point anomalies in the analysis, um, well, actually, the performance uh, of, of Kappa degrades a little, uh, but it's still doing pretty well, uh, getting pretty close to the kind of perfect score. Uh, Pelt doesn't do so well. This method is doing a little bit better, but nowhere near as good 
as Kappa and this competitor is, is finding it really tough. If we, if I showed you a more subtle scenario where the uh, uh, collective anomaly was um, much more difficult to spot, then you really start to see the differences between these different methods, but Kappa still is able to perform well. Okay, so um, Kappa is dealing with the situation where the data uh, um, are already co collected uh, and um, and we're analysing it, so in an offline setting. Um, but obviously working closely with Trevor, um, uh, having, uh, having seen the potential of the method, uh, Trevor was keen that we quickly explore you know, how, how this might work uh, if we moved it to, uh, to an online setting. And so this is again just some synthetic, some synthetic data and we're going to run just to show, uh, run this animation just to show how, uh, how the method works. So as you can see, the data is coming along. We've got our steady state baseline around zero as it happens with this data and then suddenly there's a change in mean uh, and you can see very quickly uh, the online version of Kappa spots it as well as the end of that uh, collective anomaly there. Uh, then we have a point anomaly uh, which it quickly finds on another point anomaly and another point anomaly. And then it merely goes on its way. Oh, and now there's a change in variance. Uh, uh, for a collective anomaly which it finds uh, and then quickly finds the end of it and then we have a change in mean again. Now I don't know if you just saw that but the something interesting you know, interesting from my perspective as a statistician anyway uh, was going on at, at 48 seconds around about 48 seconds so let me just take that back so if i play here you can see don't know if you caught it there as the data changes here we to that first point it first of all uh, finds it as being a uh, point anomaly and hence we get that little red dot and then it switches as it gets more evidence to assessing that stretch as being a collective anomaly so I'll just take that back a smidge again so our analysis is refining the view of the data as we're going through it in real time here okay so um, just to give a kind of a little mind map of recent development. So we started off with Kappa and from Kappa uh, we went to the online method called SCAPA, so sequential Kappa. We're very original with our naming here. Um, and then another natural question was, well, if, that's in, if that works in a univariate setting, what happens if we go to multivariate data? So we've got many variables that we're observing at once. So what, what can we do with um, this collective and point anomaly setting there uh, and then more recently we've been looking with Martin Tvetten in Oslo at uh, uh, a different setting uh, for the multivariate problem where we have um, dependence between different variables within the multivariate setting um, and then there's been some other work that we've been doing um, parallel to all of this around using a a uh, robust Kalman filter with a robust particle filter um, for anomaly detection, which I won't go into today, but uh, the reference for it will be available after the talk. OK, so in the multivariate Kappa setting, so here I'm just using it, showing some synthetic data again. Um, uh, so we've got two, two different examples of what might occur. Um, if we assume here um, that the collective anomalies can occur in, in different subsets at different times. So, for example, here between 150 and 200, the collective anomaly is occurring in, in these three channels of the data, uh, but between 350 and 400, it's in these two channels. Um, then very readily, the Kappa framework can extend to deal with this. But actually what's quite nice is we can also extend the framework, but also the theory to allow for um, um, lags at the beginning or end of an anomaly. So here you could, you know, as long as the window of the anomaly is is isn't over uh, isn't being breached, 
then we could assess these events here as being all part of the same anomaly. It's just that it's a bit later happening in the second channel here, and it starts a little later and finishes a little earlier in the third channel. Um, now, the benefit of us considering these channels together rather than e e analyzing each one individually is that we're able to borrow power across as we as we perform our statistics, which means that we're able to combine the structure that we see in the different variables uh, and leverage that to understand to see more subtle structure uh, across any one channel uh, by looking at them all than we'd see if we were just analyzing one on its own. Now within this framework we can also still incorporate point an anomalies um, and the, the, the framework works really nicely. Um, the one assumption that we make here though is that there's no cross correlation between the different channels. So each one of these channels other than where the changes are occurring are assumed to be uh, acting independent of one another. And in many settings, that would be a reasonable assumption to make, perhaps. If we move to a situation though where we have cross-correlation occurring between different channels, then um, something quite different can happen. So here, uh, uh, this is the work that we've been doing with Martin uh, at, at Oslo. Here we've got uh, the, the same data uh, on the left, uh, and the right hand side is again um, synthetic data. And what we're trying to look at here is uh, the structure that's identified. If you run in the, on the right hand side, we've run uh, cap, uh, MV kappa, assuming no cross correlation. And you can see what happens. It, it finds various point anomalies quite successfully. Um, uh, but it's only finding one estimated. Uh, coll uh, estimating one collective anomaly here, whereas the truth is that there's a collective anomaly here uh, and a collective anomaly here as well. Now, by building in the dependent structure uh, into our Kappa framework, as we have done in this left-hand side, which we analyze using Kappa CC, we're actually able to tease out a little bit more of this structure so we can find this collective anomaly correctly and most of, but not all of, this co collective anomaly uh, correctly. OK. And so uh, what we gain in, in this uh, Kappa CC framework is the ability to model the dependence across the different structures. But what we've lost in moving to this structure is we've lost this ability uh, for the moment to have this sort of uh, dithering start or end uh, on the collective anomalies uh, that we have in the MV Kappa scenario. Um, uh, and here, uh, this is uh, op operational data from a, 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 th a third party, uh, which we use in the paper to talk about the data. Here we've got uh, the challenge of detecting the time intervals of suboptimal operation within within this data sequence. So the sensors are measuring uh, several operational variables, e uh, so each one of these five sensors. Um, and we've so got several uh, expert identified periods of suboptimal operation identified here. And the question is, how does Kappa CC perform in this setting? Uh, and it turns out that it performs quite well, actually. Um, doesn't get the full extent of this anomaly here, but it does find the collective anomaly here. It also finds the collective anomaly here and says that there's one here. It also identifies an anomaly here that hadn't been previously seen. Um, so it can give rise for for experts to go back and revisit and reanalyze their interpretation of the data, for example. Um, similarly here, yes, you're, it's credible if you look at the data as, as long as we've done, it's credible that there's a collective anomaly here. Um, whether the whole collective anomaly stretches for this long, that's that's very context dependent on, I guess, the importance of this fifth sense here. OK, so to come back uh, to our, our packages, uh, well, the kind of different anomaly detection uh, methods we've developed here. So Kappa, Scappa and MV Kappa, these are all part of uh, a new R package that's been released on CRAN called Anomaly, as is the robust Kalman filter ap approach. So they're all uh, publicly available on CRAN now. Uh, Kappa CC, so the one that allows for cross correlation, that's not uh, in, in the package yet, but we expect it will be in time. OK, and then then there was FAST. So more recently with Ed Austin, who's a, a PhD student working on NGCDI, 
um, with us. We've been looking at FAST, which arises from a question coming from uh, Peter Willis. So remember from the, earlier in the talk, can you detect when a day is starting to behave differently was Peter's question. So, um, and that's an example of a, 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 a question where the anomaly um, doesn't fit the um, collective or point anomaly structure. We're looking at something a little bit different here. So the sort of data we're thinking about here are data which are kind of quite fun have a functional form to them. So if we were to overlay uh, the data for each day, uh, one after the other, we'd get this sort of common structure as if we were kind of tracing the same line out again and again and again. And uh, you know, with this uh, simulated data here, a version of uh, Pete's question would be, you know, can you detect this as being different from the bulk or can you detect the red line which was behaving fine as being different when it occurs differently. So um, as all uh, good folks do at the start, we started off by um, uh, saying yes, there is a way of doing this. We can analyze it in the literature. We can identify this day as being different from the rest and you can do it at the end of a day. And uh, Peter uh, in, in his usual very pragmatic sense said, but by the end of the day, it's obvious. We all know it's happened by then. And so that's given rise to FAST. So FAST is a, a, a functional anomaly uh, sequential test, where as the new day comes, so we've got the green day's new day, and now we've got this darker green line here as a new day. Uh, and you can see it's an anomalous at, at, at uh, around about 10 o'clock. And at the point that it becomes anomalous, it alerts. Um, uh, the purple line that behaves differently in mid morning, and as soon as it does, it alerts. So, we, what we've been doing with um, Ed Austin and, and Lawrence Bardwell is developing this approach, which allows us, as the day's data is coming in, to sequentially test the data in real time and identify whether it's deviating from the kind of the common body of the data um, from that functional form and, and alert accordingly. And there's some various results we can. Uh, give around how long the detection delay is between the actual deviation and, and when we'd spot it um, and those sorts of things as you'd hope. Okay, so some concluding remarks. Um, this has been a kind of whistle stop tour of our work on change and anomaly detection and I've, I've very deliberately structured it on the kind of talking about the general methods that we've been developing rather than the specific applications because I'm conscious working with more and more people uh, kind of data owners as time goes on, how different the challenges can be and how it's important that we take a step back and think about the generic problem. Uh, our approach uh, at, at Lancaster is one where we, we seek to do methodological development, but one that's inspired by and feeds back into the real world challenge. So, uh, various of these methods that we've talked about today, as Trevor mentioned at the beginning, have been um, trial tested and now implemented in, in BT. Um, and the real key to that success is a close collaboration with folks such as yourselves who understand the data. Um, it's only through that two-way interaction that we can really move areas like this which need more work forward. Um, the belief underlying all of this work in, um, uh, uh, in NGCDI on anomaly detection is that many of the generic anomaly problems of the future can be seen in the data that we're seeing today. We won't be able to see them all, but by any means, but many of them we'll be able to see today if we go and look and see what's there. And so the work today is just the start, really. There are many more problem types out there and much more work's needed. Um, and, and just to come back to one point that I made um, early on in the talk, um, this question of what's statistically significant or statistically a change versus what is an interesting change or anomaly from a kind of uh, a business context is one that I think is a, a space that needs a quite a bit more work going forward. And so we're now starting to un undertake work at Lancaster with um, Professor David Leslie, who's a colleague of mine, uh, developing new learning and recommendation systems to sit above the change and anomaly detection layer um, so that over time we can learn and make recommendations about which of these changes and anomalies are put through to experts so that we're not wasting time by crying wolf too often every time something triggers, but that we're learning this one is useful, this one isn't useful. So we can have some uh, autonomous learning going on in the system in the longer term. Thank you. <laughs>